Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is our latest COVID-19 uh, webinar. Um, I'm Robert Kappa, I'm one of the partners at Harris Clark Rickabees and I'm our COVID-19 lead. I'm your chair this morning. Um, the theme of this morning's webinar is uh, business interruption insurance. Um, and our speakers this morning will take you through everything you need to know um, about business interruption insurance. Um, I'm delighted to welcome two external speakers um, to our event this morning. Um, first of all, Martin Chapman, who's a partner at Baldwin's, who specialises in um, forensic accounts. Uh, and also um, Duncan Sutcliffe, who, who's a director at uh, Sutcliffe & Co um, Insurance Brokers. And then I'm also joined then by Adam Finch and Jenny Raymond, who are partners in our dispute resolution department, who focus very much on um, financial services related litigation um, and hence they're dealing with business interruption insurance claims at this time. So um, slightly different format again to today's webinar and the previous webinar we've done over the last few weeks. Uh, we've got four speakers uh, and they're actually going to mix up their, speak, their, their talks between them so we'll cut between them as the presentations develop. Um, for those of you that have attended events I've chaired before, we're not going to take uh, Q&A during the session, we're going to do Q and A um, at the very end. I know normally I like, I like an interactive um, event, but unfortunately, uh, webinars don't lend themselves that too readily. So all the Q and A at the end. Thank you to those people who had already submitted questions before this morning. Uh, I've got those ready to ask the panel. Um, and if you want to use the um, Q and A facility uh, in Zoom, I'll be keeping an eye on those questions. Uh, as they come in this morning. Um, any questions we don't have time to answer um, this afternoon, this, this morning, um, we will um, make sure we reply by email um, later. So um, all questions will be answered one way um, or another. So um, slightly different format again this morning. We're going to do a short poll. Um, we wanted to get some initial feedback from you as participants into how you're seeing the current situation regarding business interruption insurance and that will give us the opportunity to frame our presentations for you um, this morning. Four very quick questions, all will come up straight away, all to be voted on straight away please and then we'll, we'll give you sort of 30, 60 seconds to reply and then a few perhaps general comments from me and then um, depending on the replies I may ask a couple of the um, speakers to, to, to comment as well and then we'll get on then with the um, presentations themselves. So um, if we can pass over now to the poll, please. So there you go, the poll questions are up uh, and uh, in front of you. Some perhaps surprising results, but perhaps not so surprising um, results. Um, so you can see the um, results there. 59% um, of you uh, have not yet made a claim. Interesting, bearing in mind you're on a, on a, on a, a, um, a webinar to um, talk about this interruption. Um, interestingly, 82% have said they've had no claim accepted. Um, I might ask Duncan to comment on that briefly in a moment. Um, have you had a claim rejected? No. Interesting result compared to two and to answer number two. And question four, are you minded to issue a challenge Interestingly, a great unsure. Might ask Adam to comment on that. Um, Duncan, do you want to comment briefly on, on the results in terms of claims accepted and claims rejected and how that fits with, with your own experience as, a, as an insurance broker? Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, a lot of insurance companies have um, either replied with a standard, no, you're not covered, none of our policyholders are covered kind of reply or others have said, thank you for your uh, claim. We will look at it in good time and uh, are pretty much sitting on the fence or asking lots of questions and uh, umming and ahhing about the whole thing. So uh, very few uh, have actually come to a final decision yet, I think. Okay, that's helpful, Duncan. Um, Adam, what are your, what are your thought experiences in terms of people actually challenging insurance decisions. Does that, does that result there fit with what you're seeing? 
Uh, it, yes, it does. It's not a surprise and echo what Duncan just said as well. Um, there are a few examples of claims being honoured by the insurance companies. You do need very explicit wording to get home at the moment. Uh, Jenny will come on to mention what the FCA is doing and there is certainly a holding of breath at the moment waiting to see how determination of a number of these issues will pan out certainly in July when we hope the test case goes to court. So I can see why we are looking to appeal some of the decisions we made to date. Uh, it's too early to say how they'll be uh, effective or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those comments, um, Adam. I'm sure you'll comment further in your talk with um, Jenny. So, okay, so let, let's um, press on then with, with the presentations. The brief running order, uh, we're gonna start with Duncan. Uh, who is going to um, look at what the industry's position is with regard to claims. Then uh, Adam and Jenny um, are going to talk you through the claims and how to uh, make the best of a claim. And then Martin then is going to talk you through how to formulate the actual details of the claim. Um, before then coming back then for final comments on claims from both Duncan um, and Adam. And then um, back to me then for um, Q and A, and, and please do keep those those questions coming in. Uh, I can see there's already one coming uh, on the um, Q and A facility, so do please keep those going. So, um, I'll pass over to um, to Duncan. Duncan, over to you. Hi there. Um, right, if we go on to the first slide, please. Um, when the coronavirus started affecting businesses in the UK naturally a lot of them were instantly turned to their insurance in the same way that they would if they would suffered a fire or burglary and what have you and very quickly the response from the insurance industry is was well actually no people aren't covered for pandemics and this came as quite a surprise to a lot of people but why is this um well the idea of insurance is that a lot of people put a lot of money into a big pot and then if an individual or a small number of businesses suffer claims, then they get the money from the pot. So it's a lot of money to benefit the few. Um, now this doesn't work with pandemics because it affects the many. Uh, and for the same reason, insurance companies don't like to insure vast and unpredictable events like war, nuclear accidents. On top of this, insurance companies by regulation are not allowed to insure things that will put themselves at their own financial risk because some of these insurance companies, if they suddenly had to pay out many billions of claims for coronavirus, they would go bust, which would not allow them to carry on paying claims for things like fire and burglary. And lastly, insurance companies are very much based on stats. So they, price their insurance on what they have had in the past. So they understand things like fire and burglary, but they don't understand or can't price something as unpredictable as a pandemic, and certainly not a pandemic that no one had ever heard of until a few months ago. Next slide. And then the Association of British Insurers put out a statement very early on and have released numerous statements since then, which effectively says, no, you're not covered. Most businesses are not covered. You're unlikely to be successful in a claim. Next slide. So if we look a bit more closely at the different kinds of policies that you might consider. Now there's event cancellation insurance, which would cover things like sporting events, uh, festivals, and they deliberately do cover things like uh, pandemics. And we're seeing claims paid already. and We've paid some ourselves. Travel insurance, likewise, uh, it is designed to cover this kind of thing and we've paid claims already. Trade credit insurance is designed to uh, cover bills that aren't paid and it is covering claims resulting from coronavirus. And the government has actually put a lot of money into this to ensure that trade credit continues. So this leaves business interruption insurance, which is far more complex and is what we're going to concentrate on today. Next slide. There are various areas within business interruption, which I want to look at now. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Firstly, physical damage. This is the most common type of business interruption that we would normally encounter day to day. 
it requires damage to physical assets. Now, coronavirus is not really causing physical damage. And is contamin contamination of a property physical damage? Probably not. And so can we claim for cleaning up costs like we might do after a flood? No, probably not. So can we claim business interruption for physical damage? No, I don't really think so. Next slide. So another extension to business interruption is customer or supplier interruption. But again, this normally requires physical damage at a supplier or customer's premises. So same again, I don't think a claim is going to be likely down this route. Next slide. Now, a lot of policies will also cover uh, denial of access, but this would normally require physical damage within a radius of a premises. So it's covering things like uh, a collapsed bridge, which stops customers getting to your premises. So again, physical damage, I don't think claims are possible here. Next slide. Now we start to get a bit more interesting here. Some policies, not many, but some will include cover for non damage denial of access. So, have the authorities prevented access to your property? This is normally in situations where the police might put up tape and close off an area because of maybe an investigation to a crime. So, you know, there's no damage, but your access has been denied. Now, does a general lockdown count? They're not specifically uh, restricting access to your specific property. Now, it can also include a danger at your premises. Um, again, it could be uh, you know, a, a criminal running loose on your grounds. But uh, is a general lockdown something that is actually what is intended by this policy wording? Um, and sometimes it extends to a danger within a radius of your premises. It could be within a mile or 25 miles of your premises. Now, is a general lockdown relevant here? It's a bit woolly. And sometimes you might actually satisfy all the previous questions, but then there's a wording which says, yes, this is all covered, but it excludes communicable disease. So is a claim likely in this area? Well, Possibly, but you will have to jump through all the hoops of your policy wording. And be aware that things that can be put into a policy can also be taken out of a policy further down the wording. Next slide. And then lastly, a lot of policies, well, not a lot of policies, some policies will include cover for communicable disease. Now, quite a few of these policies will specify what diseases they include. So they'll have a list which will include all sorts of weird diseases like plague, uh, anthrax, legionellis. But COVID-19 is a new disease, it won't be on that list. It will also require that that disease is a notifiable disease. Well, in this case, COVID is notifiable, so yeah, we, we do succeed there. But then it might then go on to exclude pandemics. And COVID is a, is a pandemic, so we might have it taken out there. It might then also require the closure of that premises by the authorities. But does it require a specific closure of your specific premises? Will a general lockdown be satisfactory? So is a successful claim here likely? Possibly, but you would have to require all the policy conditions to be completed because this kind of insurance is designed to cover closure of your premises because maybe you have legionellis in your pipes or because a member of staff comes back from holiday with malaria. It's not designed for this sort of thing. Let's have the next slide please. So are you covered? Well if you've satisfied everything in the wording it's not still it's still not going to be straightforward because if you are covered according to the technicalities of your wording it's probably by mistake your insurer probably didn't want to insure you. And therefore, they are gonna put up a fight and argue that their wording might look like you're covered, but the intention is that they didn't want to cover you. And then if you are covered, 
there will often be restrictions within the wording to limit the maximum amount of payment. So you might normally have business interruption cover for your full revenue for say three years, but the wording will restrict that down and actually say, well, we're only covering you for a small proportion of that. And we've had some cases where we've looked at where the maximum they can, can, can claim is just a few thousand. They will also deduct any income that you've received from grants, funding, and so forth. And then they might actually say, well, yeah, you are eligible for all these things, but has the shutdown of your premises been the cause of your lost income? Or has your lost income been because people are staying at home, irrelevant to the fact whether your premises is closed or not? So it's not going to be easy persuading insurers to pay claims. And then if you can say, well, actually, you are covered, it will be then very difficult to get much money out of them. Next slide. Thank you, Duncan. A really helpful overview there of um, insurance policies and how they come together. And I think it sets the scene very neatly for uh, Adam and Jenny to give their presentations on how to uh, make a claim, the best practice of making a claim, and also actually for Martin in terms of formulating a claim. So um, I'll hand over now to uh, Adam and Jenny, please. Thank you, Robert. Um, may I have the next slide, please? So uh, in particular, thank you to Duncan as well for expertly summarising the difficulties that policyholders are facing in bringing these claims. Obviously, obvious question here is, is it as hopeless or as stark as the position has been made out? If you listen to the insurers and the Association of British Insurance, uh, certainly they're suggesting very few claims will be honoured. Um, one percentage, I, I've heard, is less than one percent of all claims will be paid out. So it is a stark position, but I guess I'm somewhat cynical as to whether it's as stark as the insurance companies are, are suggesting. Clearly, we are dealing with an unprecedented level of claims. And it's in the insurance company's interest to reduce those claims where possible. Otherwise, the insurers are suggesting that they may bankrupt themselves and the entire industry could come to a head. Again, we don't think it's quite that stark. And certainly, there are grounds to potentially submit uh, claims under the business interruption insurance. I'm going to summarise some certain areas of claims where we are advancing those claims and then Jenny will touch on how those claims can be made out and also what the FCA is doing about this situation as well. The starting position is straightforward and simple. We are dealing with a contract between the policyholder and the insurance company. Uh, the downside to this is there are literally hundreds of different policy wordings out there one has to consider not just the contract, any supporting schedules. We also encourage looking at any surrounding documentation, covering emails, letters, to help understand what cover is available. As such, we do encourage, uh, and it's essential really, to carry out a thorough review of those policies to understand what cover is available. And the other aspect of all of this is there is no certainty very few cases have gone to court dealing with pandemics as you'd expect there's a lot of case law around insurance disputes but very few around pandemics so from that perspective most people can only profess an opinion on this situation and there's no guarantee that the insurance company have interpreted the clauses correctly may I have the next slide please So as Duncan mentioned, there are a number of areas of claims that potentially might be available to policyholders. As we've seen already, the insurance company have a blanket denial of all claims as a starter for 10. Pretty much they are holding that there is no damage to property being caused by COVID-19. Therefore, the insurance does not cover these types of issues. We do disagree with that assertion. There is no clear authority to support the insurers on that situation. COVID-19 is causing a shutdown of policyholders' premises. It's impairing the use and the function of their premises and causing damage. The insurance is there to cover risks. 
And we have seen that potentially there is poten uh, possible claims that can be made under certain specific extensions of cover, as Duncan mentioned. One aspect we are particularly focusing on is denial of access. Again, the insurers are defending such claims on the grounds that there is no identifiable emergency event, which has happened in a localised geographical area to our client's premises. Ordinarily or quite often that's within a mile radius of the premises or up to 25 miles radius. Again, they use examples. Duncan mentions all the criminal on the loose. We've had World War II bombs being quoted as an example or gas leaks. Again, that's where they the insurance companies are expecting to look to pay out, not for reasons arising from COVID-19. However, reading into the detail of the policies, a lot of these terms are not defined. What is an incident likely to endanger human life or property? There's no doubt that COVID-19 endangers human life. Similarly, COVID-19 affects nationally throughout the entire country. So by and large, one can address the radius issue. We're both saying that I am dealing with one sports club based in a rural locality where we're probably going to struggle proving an example of COVID took place within a mile radius. Undoubtedly, the premises are being hindered and affected and as such, there is a potential claim to be made under denial of access. We're running similar arguments around loss of attraction and cancellation insurance from that perspective, and there are more easier claims to, to overcome and succeed with. Again, at this stage, we're waiting for insurance companies to respond. Finally, as Duncan mentioned, quite often these policies may include a notifiable disease extension. Again, a number of insurers will have an exhaustive list of diseases that's covered. COVID is new and therefore it may not fall within that list. However, some of those lists are not as exhaustive as the insurance companies are making out. Some include pandemics. One we've seen specifically includes SARS. Now the scientific name of COVID is SARS-CoV-2. Again, there is an argument to suggest that that may be covered by uh, this particular extension. May I have the next slide, please? Invariably, if it was straightforward, we wouldn't get involved as insurance litigation specialists. Our position isn't straightforward. We are dealing with the interpretation of contracts. Thankfully, there has been considerable case law in and around how those contracts can be interpreted by the courts and judges. For example, without going into too much detail, but the leading case, Arnold and Britain, has set out that the courts would adopt a natural meaning to the words and adopt a plain English interpretation. The courts would also consider the purpose of the insurance and we're submitting that the whole process here is to cover risk and interruption to that client's businesses. From that perspective, that is the purpose of the insurance. It is not to go behind the insurance company's intentions as to whether or not they would be covering these types of policies. Finally, and equally important, the insurance company relies on standard terms and conditions. They drafted these contracts. Uh, policyholders have very little sway in changing those terms. As such, any ambiguity will be interpreted against the insurance company. I will now hand over to Jenny to talk about how one can proceed with a claim. Thanks, Adam. Um, next slide, please. So as Adam mentioned, I'm going to cover sort of the steps that you need to take if you do consider that you have business interruption insurance um, and issues and things you need to look out for. Um, so interestingly, in going back to the poll at the start, um, one of the most important things for you to be to be doing is notifying um, and sort of taking those steps promptly is really important. Um, so I noticed that a number of you hadn't as yet made a claim. Um, recommend that you have a look at your insurance policy um, and check what the notification provisions are in there. Often it does say within 30 days of becoming aware of an event giving rise to a claim. Um, and it's certainly arguable that the date we went into lockdown, which was the 26th of March, and business is therefore required to shut maybe that event. Um, so as such, speak to your broker, um, check your policy, and yeah, like I say, take, take steps to make sure that 
um, that box is, is ticked effectively. Um, on the basis cover is accepted and again going back to the poll it doesn't look like that's necessarily going to be the case for many people but on the basis cover is accepted the most important thing you do is look to gather as much evidence as possible um, with a view to quantifying your claim. Um, I, I think um, Marty's going to talk about this in a bit more detail in, in due course but um, it's important to ascertain what your losses are but less your costs that you've saved as, and also um, Duncan's already touched upon that so therefore any grants etc received from the government the furlough scheme that all needs to be taken into consideration. Um, the chances are that cover is likely to be refused on the basis of what we've heard so far so on that basis, it's important to once again, go back to your policy and have a look at what the complaints process is. Again, it's important to adhere to that um, and consider making a formal complaint, um, which we'd recommend preparing in the basis of a letter of claim, setting out the reasons why you dispute the, the sort of the position being adopted by the insurer. Um, subject to the outcome of that process, your options are twofold. Either you, if you qualify, you could look to pursue um, matters through the Financial Ombudsman Service or alternatively um, be considering court proceedings. In respect of the Financial Ombudsman Service, um, firstly, there's a cap on the, on the amount of compensation that you'll recover, which is 350,000. And also the FOS only applies to smaller businesses, um, also known as, so there's smaller businesses who are um, of an annual turnover of less than six and a half million pounds um, or a balance sheet of less than five million um, and employ less than 50 people. Um, so again, some people won't qualify as such, but if it is an option open to you and subject to the losses that you've suffered, um, something worth considering. It's a lower cost option. You wouldn't be responsible for paying the insurer's costs if you're unsuccessful. And the Ombudsman will look at it on the basis of what's fair and reasonable albeit that we're aware that the Financial Ombudsman Service and the FCA are working quite closely throughout this pandemic in respect of business interruption insurance. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so one of the important and critical factors to be considering are causation and loss. Um, so insurers are likely to scrutinise the losses that you've suffered. Um, they're going to be considering whether those losses have been suffered as a result of COVID-19 and the pandemic or any, altern any um, other factors. So by way of example, in terms of external factors, you know, um, but for the fact that the business was closed, would you have suffered those losses in any event? I.e. if you're a shop on the high street, um, yes, the business is closed, but even if it had been open, would anyone have actually um, attended um, the premises and, and actually purchase any items given the sort of the lack of confidence in the economy at the moment. And also they'll be looking at internal factors. So staff shortages, the mismanagement of the pandemic, um, all of that will be critically examined in order for the insurers to look to try and limit um, any um, indemnity that's provided. So what you will be required to provide, and, and Martin will go into this in more detail, but will be disclosure of management and profit and loss accounts for your previous years, as well as your budgets and forecasts um, going forwards. Um, and as um, Duncan's already touched upon, there's often limits in the, in the policies as to the amount that you're likely to be able to recover. A um, couple of um, policies that we've been looking at, it's they are entitled under the denial of access provision, um, to potentially recover losses for three months up to a limit of, say, by way of example, £500,000. Um, so again, it's important to revert back to your policy and to consider what losses are claimable. Um, and the other important element of the policy to, to be considering are any exclusions and caps in respect of particular types of losses. Again, we've seen a particular policy whereby um, cover is excluded if the premises was unoccupied at the time of the event. Therefore, by way of example, if you'd already um, left the premises in anticipation of lockdown, then that could potentially cause an issue. Next slide, please. Um, so as we've touched upon, the FCA has taken quite a proactive role in respect of business interruption insurance claims at the present. Um, on the 1st of May, there was an announcement that it intended to, to obtain or to take steps in respect of a test case to proceed through the, course, uh, to the, through the courts to have a look at some of the contractual uncertainties regarding insurance policies. Um, 
whilst we were initially quite cynical as to the steps being taken, as our understanding was that they were solely liaising with the insurer, what's materialised over the course of the last six weeks is that actually there's been both liaison with insurers and with policyholders, um, and there's been an invite extended to all policyholders to um, participate in the preparation of that test case. Um, a, there was an announcement um, last week and we understand that the claim was issued yesterday at court um, and is due to be heard towards the end of July. Um, and a number of questions have been put to the court on the basis of some assumed facts um, and some assu assumed issues. So, and, and some of these questions I can see have already come up as part of the Q&A. So some of the issues that the court is being asked to consider is, for example, what is meant by business interruption? Is closure required? And if so, is that got to be complete closure or can it be part closure? Um, in respect of notifiable disease, does that include COVID-19? Um, and you know, an, an issue that's already been touched on this morning is if a disease is required to be in the vicinity of the premises, what does that mean? And also what evidence needs to be provided given that, you know, that there may be COVID-19 within the vicinity, but no, not everyone's been tested. So how, how is the policyholder supposed to, supposed to prove that? Um, and again, you know, what does the policyholder have to prove in respect to denial of us, um, access? So these are all issues that are being put toward, uh, to the court. Um, like I say, likely to be heard at the end of, um, towards the middle to the end of July. Um, we anticipate that it will, won't be until August that there's actually a decision made. Um, and then obviously there's always the risk that that could be subject to an appeal. Um, but for now, it's a bit of a watching brief um, and, and something that it's important to be bearing in mind going forwards. And next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, and just to summarise what both Adam and I have covered this morning in terms of steps to take, it's really important to carefully review the policy. Um, there may be ambiguity in the business interruption clauses, so it's important to, to have a look at those carefully. Um, speak to your broker um, and or take steps to notify if, if you consider that you do have a claim. Um, and if the claim is rejected, consider what your next steps are. And whether it be through the Ombudsman Service or the courts. Um, and as mentioned just now, I would recommend sort of keeping up to date with what the FCA is doing. Um, there is the option to sign up to their um, update. So if we could pass back to Robert, I think Martin it will take the next steps. So um, <clears throat> thank you, um, Jenny, uh, and also Adam for your uh, presentations there on um, how to bring a claim together. Really interesting perspective there in, in how to do that and um, some great practical tips as well as the, the technical detail there for people. Um, we're now going to hand over to Martin. Um, who is a forensic accountant at Baldwin. He's going to talk us through how to formulate the detail of the claim. Um, so um, Martin, over to you. Okay, um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so if you could just move on to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, I've probably got the least interesting um, part, I would, I would say, of, of, of this. Um, but actually, one of the key things is, obviously, there's no point making a claim if you're not going to get paid for it. So also important, the fact that you're going to get some money. Um, getting it right is massively important. The insurers will be looking for something they can easily see um, is is well supported. Um, so some of the things I'm going to talk about here, I'm going to almost remove COVID-19 a little bit from, from this talk so I can almost pull together how you would do a typical claim and also look at a typical pro forma and some of the things you need to look about. Um, my slides do have a lot of detail on, I'm not going to read all the detail on it, but you will be provided slides so you can get that. I think the first thing to really consider with BI is it's trying to get you back to that pre-loss position. So that's the real purpose of it. Um, they're generally arranged in two ways, so gross profit or gross revenue. Um, gross profit is more, more common um, and something that I, I, I work with a lot more. Um, it's more complicated to work out than gross revenue. Um, normally you'd be insured for gross profit if you're manufacturing retail and latter for service and professional businesses. Both are claimable, but both of them slightly different. So if we could just move on to the next slide, please. So what are the key components? Well, 
I'm hoping that your insurance broker or your insurer, when you took this out, will have explained some of these things for you because they're massively important when you are making the claim. So the first thing is, well, how long can I claim for after the incident? So this is often referred to as your indemnity period, um, common 12 to 24 months. Um, so basically you have the incident and then you can basically claim up to the end of that indemnity period. There might be some restrictions on that, but that's what you're looking for. Then obviously the other key thing here will be, well, how much can I claim for? So again, when you took out the insurance policy, they should have been looking at what your gross profit or gross turnover was, depending on which basis you are insured on. Um, I think this has been touched upon a few times. Um, cost savings. You can't claim for something you're not paying for, so you will be expected to deduct any cost that you are, you're not incurring as a result of the incident. And the last one on, on here is really your increased cost of working is often referred to as ICWs. So you might be incurring extra costs as a result of an incident, which you weren't doing pre-loss. So these are extra costs that you often agree with your insurer and try to get paid um, as a result of trying to get you back to that pre-loss position. Um, I put a little bonus there because as an accountant, this is a great thing for me. Often I get involved in um, quantifying losses and you are able to claim back some of those, um, some of those costs um, to, to get your money back. So don't forget that if you do use an external person, whether you can you claim that back again, it would probably be something written in your insurance policy. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, yes, this is very simple. Keep it simple. I was always told keep it simple, stupid, I think was a phrase that I've been used. And I think this is great for putting together a claim. Basically pull together on a summary page what you're claiming for and then have the supporting detail and supporting calculations with that. Um, so if you just run through this here is you're talking about your profit that you've lost. You're then taking off your cost savings. You're adding these increased costs of workings and then you may be claiming back a percentage of your accountancy fees. So if I just run through the, the next detail on the next slide. So gross profit. Now, when we're talking about lots of gross profit here, um, it's different to the gross profit that you're all familiar with in your financial statements. And um, again, there's a lot of detail on this, this slide here, but I think it's that, that last one. So the gross profit is calculated by deducting variable expenses, which are known as uninsured working expenses from that turnover. And then adjustments are made for differences between open and closing stock. So when you look at your insurance policy, it should define what your gross profit is, but do think of it as being different to what your gross profit is in your profit and loss account. So now if we just move on to the next slide. So how are we calculating our gross profit and what are we looking to do? Well, I talked about an incident occurring. So you're, you're basically claiming for gross profit up to the, the maximum indemnity period that you have. The idea is to get you back to that pre-loss position. So if you get there within two months, you, you can basically get the, the claim based on those two months. But if it's taking you up to the indemnity period, you can keep claiming until you're almost back to that pre-loss position. So how do you actually calculate it? Well, what you're trying to look at is what have you achieved gross profit wise after the incident compared to what you have achieved prior to the incident, often looked on a prior year basis, but please don't just think that's it. And the amount of times I um, look at this and it's, it's these, these three things that I often see, there could be issues with your seasonality of your business. You might have had a one-off impact that happened in the prior year, which actually meant your prior year profits weren't actually your standard year profits. There could be a business change. You might have done a betterment to that business. I did a cl uh, claim uh, not that long ago. It was a restaurant which had a car that crashed through its window. Um, and the claim was calculated based on looking at prior year. What they had done a month beforehand is they'd increased the size of the restaurant um, in terms of numbers of tables, they'd increased the bar size, and they'd only had a month where they'd actually had, I suppose, an enhanced gross profit. So when you looked at the prior year, it didn't actually correspond to what they were hoping to achieve. So there needed to be an uplift in that claim. We got an uplift of, I think, when we calculated by 50% of what was originally claimed, and we actually got 85% of my fees back as well, so I had one happy client. Um, so do think about that. So if we just move on to the next slide. I talked about cost savings and cost savings are important. Um, if you're not incurring the cost, then you can't claim for it. So try to be realistic on what you're actually not paying for. So things might be lighting heat, motor expenses. If you've got temporary staff, you can't claim for that. So you will need to deduct that. And then we've also talked about in the 
I suppose the COVID-19 environment, some of the um, grants and funding that you may have got, you may have furloughed staff. Again, you've got to make sure you're not double counting when you're putting together your claim. So if you move on to the next slide. Um, increased cost of workings are massively important. Um, if you think you have a shutdown of your business for whatever reason, um, during that period, you might have um, some costs that you're incurring in addition. So if you're trying to get back to that pre-loss position, you might have had overtime costs, you might have to move premises. Um, there's loads of things that, that are listed here that you might have to think about. One of the key things I often think in ICWs is, is maybe additional advertising or some additional costs that you, you want to do to mitigate your loss and put yourself back into that pre-loss position. Um, so I think really having these increased costs of workings in your mind is really important. But don't try to start incurring additional costs such as advertising without speaking to your insurer. It's better to have that dialogue so you get that agreed. So if we just move on to the, the next slide. So we talked about obviously putting together your claim and that's all very well and good, but what are some of the practical points of behind the numbers? Well, the insurer really wants cooperation. So let's try to cooperate with them. They obviously are getting a bit of a hit at the minute with COVID-19 in terms of they're playing hardball and saying they're not gonna pay out. Well, in any claim, the more cooperation you have, the better. So if you want to show you're trying to mitigate your losses, think about your ICWs, it could be a way of doing this. Um, again, that, that restaurant case that I worked on, what we agreed with the insurer was we had an opening party. The idea being that we wouldn't then run the losses up to the full and to the indemnity period because we tried to mitigate our losses by basically telling everyone we we're open again. And we agreed a budget for doing that. Have communication with the insurer or the appointed advisor, typically a loss adjuster. Again, have good dialogue. I'm happy if we're involved that um, someone like an accountant will be able to have that dialogue um, with the loss adjuster and we'll be able to share our calculations with them and try to make the process easier. Gave you a really tip, uh, simple pro forma. I think clearly setting out your claim with supporting documentation is massively important. So have a summary table, then have the calculations, then have your supporting document is a good way of looking at it. I think the next point is massively important. Again, be reasonable. Don't make a ridiculous and spe speculative claim. Um, if you make something look silly to begin with, it does put insurers back up. So, I've worked um, for claimants and I've also worked on behalf of insurers looking at complex BI claims. And I know if I see a ridiculous claim and I'm working for an insurer, it does make you want to knock it down even further. So just think about that. They might have that in their own head. Um, I think in terms of um, agree the ICWs with insurer, if possible, I think I've talked about that. And the last one is really important. Again, discuss interim payments. If you're, uh, got an indemnity period of 24 months you're not expected to wait till 24 months and get the payment at the end the idea is that you manage your cash flow by asking for interim payments um, the insurer will be quite happy with that because they're managing their own cash flow so do discuss interim payments with your loss adjuster or the insurer when you're making claims and on to the last slide please for me um, just to move away from bi a little bit as well just think about insurance generally I have um, a number of conversations with clients where they say, I don't actually know what I'm insured for, which is not great considering insurance can be quite important to you. So do and speak to your insurance brokers about what, you, what you're actually covered for. With BI, make sure that it's relevant to you and keeps being relevant to your business. Don't be underinsured. Make sure your gross profit is now what your business is, um, operates at. Make sure the indemnity period is right for your business. There's nothing worse than a business that's grown and they've set their gross profit at their their pre-growth position, so a turnover of a million pound, they're now a five million pound turnover business. When you come to working out gross profits, that's gonna really hit you because you can only be insured to what your policy says. Think about what else you're not covered for. So in the um, COVID-19 pandemic at the moment, uh, there's a lot of issues around cybercrime and cybersecurity. You might wanna think about whether I want to have insurance around that. And I think my last point that I'd like to make, uh, which I make to my clients very regularly, which is don't treat it as just another cost in your P&L account. Um, you're basically, insurance is there for you paying today to protect your tomorrow. And that's kind of how I, I, I like, like, like to think about it. So I think that is me finished. If we move on to the next slide, and I think we're going back to Duncan. Thank you, um, Martin. Really helpful insights there as to um, 
how people should be putting the, the detail and the, uh, the figures behind their pen together. Duncan, um, some final closing thoughts from you, I think, now. We've talked about some of the things that we're struggling with about business interruption, but there are some things that you should be thinking of aside from that. Your business uh, is likely to have shrunk in terms of wages and turnover. You can speak to your insurer and uh, ask to reduce your current premium. Uh, and the same if you've no longer have the same amount of stock or vehicles and so on. Again, get them to reduce your premium. We've, re we've refunded thousands of pounds for clients on this basis. And insurers are actually being relatively flexible and human about some of these situations. Normally unoccupied premises would require additional security and would get reduced cover. Most insurance companies are allowing normal cover to continue. They're being flexible with regarding payments and installments. They're allowing office equipment to be taken home and insured at the home at no extra cost. And they're allowing vehicles to be used for a wider range of things. So speak to your insurer and your broker about how they can help you with the current situation as well as the business interruption. And I think um, Adam's got a few points as well. Thanks, Thank Duncan. You, you have some more slide, the, please. Uh, Adam, over to you. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Duncan. Yeah, just to reiterate, the FCA on the 3rd of June has asked the insurance companies to carry out a product review. They recognise that the risk presenting pre-COVID is not the same now. For example, if your business is closed, you're not going to have employees on site. You're certainly not necessarily open to the public. But before I have a virtual poke from Duncan, I'm not advocating you cancel all insurance policies. Speak to your broker and have a look at whether you can obtain a refund on some of your premiums. And it can be worth a reasonable amount. We are starting to see some insurers, as Duncan alluded to, starting to return some monies. Uh, not a lot on, on occasions, but it's a start. Finally, uh, if that's not enough to be concerned with, we're also advising clients in around to the wider satellite issues arising from COVID-19, uh, issues around return to work, return to the office, the obligations placed upon the business owners, the directors, officers, to ensure they have an effective plan in place to mitigate the situation. The last thing you want to be doing is facing a claim from employees, from the public, uh, arising from defective mechanisms uh, to try and prevent the infection of COVID-19. Invariably, this is also triggering additional issues in the professional arena, and our construction team is seeing knock-on effect on deadlines for projects not being met because of the supply chain breakdown. Finally, and unfortunately, we are seeing a number of claims coming through for defective PPE and fraud arising from this. Unfortunately, one of my clients has ordered a, a large volume of gloves uh, from a European supplier, which turned out to be a fraud, and they've been left high and dry. They are due to supply a high street retailer who has a very aggressive reputation for litigation, and we're doing everything possible to try and buy more time to source gloves from another supplier. So do take care from that perspective. Just finally, there's a few takeaways from all of this. As Duncan touched on, do speak to your broker as to whether you may be able to make a claim. Don't listen to the insurance company. It's not all doom and gloom. That percentage, certainly the 1% of possible claims will increase. As Jane mentioned, the FCA is looking to remove levels of ambiguity. So hopefully, we will see those goalposts shifting, moving in the right direction come July, August time. And finally, have a look generally at your policies. Again, speak to your broker to see whether there is an opportunity to save on premiums. I believe we've had a number of questions come in, so back to Robert to pick those up. Thank you. Um, thanks, Adam uh, and Duncan for those further thoughts. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, lots of questions come in. We'll try and get through as many of them, but. Um, we only have around 10 minutes left and I'm conscious that people want, to, want us to finish on time and uh, enable people to get back to their desks. So the first question, um, one for um, Duncan probably uh, and Adam, um, John, for a question from John Richards. Um, their renewal was the end of March. They've got different underwriters now as opposed to uh, before then. Um, they saw a drop off in March that's carried on since. 
um, can they claim against both underwriters um, or will each other say, no, you claim against, against the other? Thoughts on that particular issue for, for John Richards? Yeah, that's a tricky one for you. Um, I would claim against both of them um, and see what comes back. Uh, different policies are worded in different ways. Some require our, our claims made policies or some are claims occurring. So I would have a go at both. I'd also try and look at getting uh, a refund on premium from your current policy as well. Yeah, okay. I can go with that. Uh, from that perspective, in, if in doubt, claim against both. There is nothing to lose from that perspective, because the risk is the insurers will point at each other and try and avoid any claims. And then um, an anonymous question now. Um, government has closed their events business. What sort of insurance clauses can they claim on? Um, probably back, back to Duncan on that, please. Yeah, it very much depends on your particular insurance that you hold. Um, the event companies that we insure will tend to have event cancellation cover with communicable disease extension. Um, that's a fairly black and white yes or no, you're covered or you're not. Um, business interruption for event or in organisers, uh, if you've got that cover, you're going to have the same hurdles to jump that we discussed earlier. Um, I think it's a, a clear, careful look at what you've got. Um, you may be fortunate. Okay, thank you for that. Um, back then to a question from uh, John Richards, uh, who's got a question about his insurance policy wording requiring that allows the claims uh, based on a notifiable disease in 25 miles of the premises uh, and hate to see requiring employers to notify insurance instances of COVID-19. And um, would that allow him to claim under that particular clause? Um, probably one for, for, for Adam and Duncan that. Please. Yeah, probably from my perspective, um, a typical lawyer to answer, I'm afraid, Rob, it will depend on the terms and conditions of the exact wording of that policy, but it's a good starting place to look as to what hurdles are required in order to bring a claim. But there is a potential there, and it's certainly worthwhile greater scrutiny. Yeah, I would agree with Adam. Uh, you need to look at your policy wording. I'm a pessimist. I think the chances are slim, but it's worth a pop. I'm an optimist, Duncan, but uh, I have to be being a litigator. So uh, I don't think there's anything to lose by looking. Okay, thank you, um, uh, um, and uh, Duncan, for your uh, response to that question. Question there from John Alexander, uh, who's got a business supply to the retail trade, um, and obviously due to um, closure of retail outlets, he's had, a, he's had large cancellations. What type of wording should he be looking for in his insurance policy to cover the losses based on these cancellations. Um, Duncan, one for you, and Adam, rather than giving, it to, giving you another question, I'll, I'll ask Jenny perhaps if she's got thoughts on that particular uh, question. Duncan and Jenny? Yeah, I, I think from a standard business interruption claim, there's unlikely to be much success there. It'll be in the wording, but I doubt you've got cover. Uh, if you have a trade credit policy, then that would be something that you might want to look at. I think this might be more for the lawyers to look at some sort of breach of contract. Adam, really? Yeah, whilst I'm similar to Adam, more of an optimist in these circumstances than Duncan, I think Duncan's right, it possibly is one more of a breach of contract claim rather than necessarily being an insurance matter. But again, as we've stated all along, it's probably worth just having a look back through your policy um, and discussing it with your broker and, and seeing if, if there are ways in which that can be carved out. Super, thank you both. And we're rattling through these questions this morning, so we should still be finishing on time, which is good news to be able to get back to the desk. Question now from Emma Wallace, and a question for Adam in particular. Um, insurer and insured come to a limited insurance claim settlement, and then subsequently the test case gives a wider interpretation of the policy, such that the amount that would have been settled would have been higher. And um, can the insured go back to the insurer at some point given they've already accepted a lower settlement? I suspect we all fear the answer to this question. But uh, well, actually, possibly not, Robert. You're right. Generally, any settlement in full and final is the end of the matter. But the FCA is requiring insurance companies to carry out a full review of all potential policyholders. 
and where they stand in all of this. And that review will take into account the FCA's test case as well. So it's not quite a finality to the situation as we normally would expect. Okay, so last couple of questions. Question now from Stuart Callison. Um, they have an infectious diseases extension to their disease interruption policy, which you would have thought put them in a good position, um, and it covers them uh, if they have to close due to notify events. So again, you would have thought that they were in a good position, but the insurers have insisted this, this does not apply because they closed on the government's instruction and not due to an outbreak of their premises. Um, what thoughts um, would the panel have generally, perhaps um, Duncan uh, and Adam again, as to the ability to challenge that particular decision? Yeah, this is definitely a notifiable disease, but your policy may actually list which notifiable diseases the, the insurance company is covering. If it doesn't, then you know, it gives you a bit more hope that this is a notifiable disease. Um, and Adam said earlier on that this is a danger across the country in every premises with every person. So I would push for this, but it will all come down to your policy wording. It will do, and, and Jenny may be able to jump in here. This is, I believe, one of the issues the FCA may be looking at as the impact of lockdown as to causation and the losses that may play. Yeah, that's right. The FCA have been the FCA has specifically put to the court sort of how do you define um, whether or not you've had a notifiable event, particularly in the circumstances where you may have had people who have had the symptoms but they haven't been tested. Um, so it is uncharted territory a little bit at the moment, but I certainly think there's mileage in looking at it um, and seeing if an argument could be carved out. Um, because I think there's arguments on both sides and at the moment there's no clear authority. Okay, thank you um, for that, Duncan, Adam uh, and, and Jenny. Final question then of the morning from Nick Stewart. Um, what's your view on dental practices being able to make a successful claim? Obviously lots of the news these last few days about dentists starting to reopen, uh, but lots of them still actually very restricted in their operations. Um, Duncan, what experience have you got of active with dentists? Cool. <laughs> Painful. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, this is a, a really difficult one and it will come down to um, policy wordings. Um, you're at risk of uh, claims against you yourself for infecting staff and patients. It's a real minefield. Um, yeah, I'm going to back out of this one. Adam, any thoughts? Uh, unfortunately, um, back to the policy terms and conditions, I've reviewed a few dental practice policies. Unfortunately, one of them had very few sort of additional peril extensions, so my advice was somewhat stark. So again, dig out your policy wording, your schedules, have a look to see whether you have additional risk in play. We've sort of summarised the core ones that may be more fertile in order to advance a claim. Okay. Um Thank you um, for that, Adam, your closing thoughts in response to that question. Um, that deals now with most of the questions that came into the um, Q&A uh, facility whilst we were talking. I can see a couple of last questions have come in. Um, don't worry about those. We will be replying to them. Likewise, if anybody's emailed us this morning or before with questions, then actually we will be replying to those as well. And um, there'll be an email sent out very shortly this morning um, to uh, give you a copy of the presentations and also then the, um, the, the Q&A. Um, and we'll also be sending you some resources within that email, including our um, business interruption insurance policy review service uh, and a questionnaire as to um, how we can improve on our webinar. So please do keep a lookout for that. Um, our next webinar um, is on the 20th of June, and that is um, future work and how the workplace looks once we start to get back into our offices and factories. Um, and, and you can start to link, uh, book on the link um, with that, which will be in the email which follows up from that. Otherwise, um, if I can then thank the um, participants this morning and attendees for uh, coming along and joining us, thank you very much but also finally to um, thank our speakers this morning for their time and insights. 
um, on the issue of business interruption insurance. Um, with that, everybody, uh, thank you very much, and we will close. <laughs>